In this video, we're going to look at all of the features that the character physics add-on currently has. Keep in mind, we're adding new features every day. Character physics is a new way of thinking about how to do animation, using three basic concepts. First, it uses a standard character rig with an identical pose target. Instead of posing your character, you pose the target, then let the physics engine move your character towards the target poses. This automatically adds realism to your animation. Second, you can directly interact with the physics using influence targets. This way you can let the character physics engine add realism to your character's motion, but you still get precise control of how your character moves. Third, using the collision system, your characters can interact with the environment. Now let's go over all of the existing features. If you see features here that are not included in the version of character physics that you purchased, that's probably because you did a one-time purchase on Blender Market or Gum Road and didn't provide your email address. If you did a one-time purchase and you want to provide me with your email address, I'll make sure that you get six months of updates for free. If you signed up for a monthly subscription, you'll get the latest version every month as long as your subscription stays active. So let's start with the basics. The first thing you're going to need is some kind of armature. And I'm going to make it slightly more interesting than just a single bone, only slightly. And then I'm going to duplicate it. And now this is gonna be our physics guy and this is gonna be our pose target. So we're gonna go over here to setup. And first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is select your pose target. So it needs to be identical to your original armature. And now that you have your pose target, as soon as we start our animation, then it falls. And if we go back to frame one, it will automatically reset at frame one because the frame reset is set to one right here. Now, if you don't want it to just fall into space, you can go into our next panel, which is colliders. And it says select a mesh object. So we're gonna add a mesh object. In this case, just a cube. And now we wanna set this to collider. If we let this fall, it's not gonna do anything, but if we click the collider checkbox, it will now fall and land on our box or cube, like that. And then the next thing I wanna show you is influence targets. So we're going to go into pose mode and select a bone, we'll do the base bone in this case, and we're going to go into the influence targets panel, and we're going to add a head target. And we'll turn the spring value up a little bit, and what that does is now we can control this physics armature by animating or moving this thing around, and we can control how much influence it has by turning this value up or down so we can let the physics have a lot of control and this have very little, or we can set it all the way to one and it will follow it exactly. Another kind of influence target that you can have is a rotation target. So we're gonna add a rotation target and we're gonna set the rotation value up. And now when this runs, we have our directional target or our spring target here. And then we have our rotation target. And now that bone's gonna try to match the rotation angle of this guy. I often find it's easiest to make the rotation uh, child of the spring target so that you can control both like this. And now, when we pose our pose target, we're going to get physics-based movements based on whatever we do over here with our pose target. And that is the essence of how you use the character physics plugin. Uh, everything else is basically just expanding on these concepts. All right, now let's look at everything related to friction and colliders. So I've built a rig here that will basically just be stable so it can sort of stand on four feet. And I'm gonna duplicate it so I get a pose target. And then I'm gonna pretend like I'm not doing this for the second time and that I'm starting over from scratch and setting up my pose target to be this duplicate. 
And now when I hit go, I should see it fall, which is what I want. I can reset that. And now I want to set this object to be a collider. And by default, the friction will be at 0.2. So we're, we'll pretend like we're starting at the default settings here. So now you'll see that the when it falls, the feet are allowed to slide to some extent, but then they stop. And this is because of the static friction setting. And the static friction setting is actually on the physics armature itself. And that is going to be underneath physics when you have your physics armature selected. Down at the very bottom, it's set to 0 0.03. And what happens here is it actually has to have a force, given its motion with gravity and velocity and all that stuff, that will move it a distance of whatever is greater than this in blender units before it will allow it to slide. So I, it's looping right now. If I set this to zero, you'll see that it will just freely slide. And if I set this to something higher, then when it falls, it's going to stick because it doesn't have enough force to move this far. So if I put it at like 0 0.01, then that would be something like a realistic, or depending on how much mass you have, a could be a realistic way that it would behave in real life, where if the feet are moving fast enough, it will slide along the ground until it slows down enough that the static friction kicks in and just stops it. And when the static friction distance is enough or small enough that it overcomes it, so let's just set it at zero so you can see that. Then it's going to take the friction of the ground, which is currently set to 0.2, and then the friction of each bone and multiply those two together to get like the amount of friction. So like if we crank this up, then it's going to move a lot more slowly. So by mixing static friction and the dynamic friction settings, or just the regular friction settings, you can get whatever effects you're looking for. You can also set the friction on individual bones. And when you set the friction on an individual bone, like, let's just set the ground friction all the way up. And then let's set the friction on, like, the bones on this side to, let's see, friction head uh, is going to be the head here or the head here, and then friction tail is going to be the tail. And then what ends up happening is since these bones basically uh, share a, a node or a connection, this bone's tail is the same as this bone's head. So whatever you set this one's tail to, uh, it's going to get mixed with the head of this one. So like if you set this one to 0.5 and you set this one to 0.5, then it's going to mix the friction of those two. If they're both set to 1, it'll be a friction of 1. You can experiment with that to see what I'm talking about. So we're going to set the tail friction of this bone. Um, in this case, let's just set it to 0. And we'll do the same thing for this one. I'll set it to zero. And now, in theory, when we run this, it slides on this side, but it's stuck on this side. All right, now let's just set all the bones back to one. And you can do that by just updating that property, the all bone friction property. Uh, another interesting thing you can do is you can control the friction on the ground with the friction vertex group. So currently the CP friction group, which whenever you toggle collider on and off, it's going to create this vertex group for you. You can control friction on the ground by changing the weight there and then updating the collider. So for example, we're going to make it really slick up here on the top. And... We're going to keep it like 100% friction down here on the bottom. So the friction up here will be set to 0, and the friction down here will be set to 1. So we'll 
change that weight to zero. And then we actually have to like toggle this on and off to update the vertex weights. Uh, so now it will slide down and maybe we want to turn off the reset. So underneath setup, the frame reset, uh, my animation is looping to frame 169 happens to be what I have it set to, and then it's resetting every time. So it starts at one. So as long as we're not on some frame between one and 169, it will never reset. So we're just going to let it run. And then when it gets down here and hits that sticky spot, it's going to catch. And in this case, it flips over because there's friction on the ground there. Did you notice the collisions look a little wonky? And that's because the collision system is very, very simple at this point. Collisions are only being detected uh, on the armature uh, as basically a sphere around the head and tail of the bones. So to change the size of the collision area around the tail of the bone or the head of the bone, uh, I want to show this. I kind of don't want it sliding while I'm doing this. So I'm going to go back to this guy, my collision mesh, and I'm going to turn the friction back up on that. And now as soon as I toggle that, then the friction goes back up to 1, which is what I wanted. So let's go ahead and reset this. And now it's going to stick and stay there. And by default, the collision size is going to be set to 0.3 on all of these. And that setting is underneath the physics. Once you have your armature in pose mode and you have an active bone, uh, and then the setting will also apply to whichever bones are selected, I believe, if the code is working correctly. So I can set the tail radius to 0.2, for example, and uh, you'll see that the collision margin changes for whichever bones I have selected when I do that. And you'll want to set your collision for whatever you're doing. You probably want your collision to match the mesh that is around your character rig. So like the surface of your character's foot or the bottom of your character's foot would match where it's touching the ground here and you just set that distance to whatever you need to to make it look right for what you're doing. And then if you wanted to set like the radius here, well this this radius here is actually going to be a mix of the head radius of of this bone, so this is this bone's head and the tail radius of this bone. So this point is this bone's tail. So I could go into the tail radius here and if I make it large enough it will actually start to collide with the ground. Uh, so this collision is actually like a gigantic circle around the tail of this bone slash the head of this bone. So you could say you can control this node with either a head or a tail. So if I change the head radius then it basically averages uh, between this bone and this bone to decide what size that should be. I do have plans for a much more sophisticated collision system. It's in the development roadmap, but for now this will actually do quite a bit, and it's also very fast. If you are subscribed, then you will get the updates to the collision system as soon as they are released. Continuing through the features, underneath setup we have this option for an alt target. What that's for, if you wanted to write the updates to a different armature that matches your pose target and your physics armature, you can select that alternate target. And now we don't really need anything up here on the alternate target, but on the physics armature we have the alternate target, which is this guy, selected. And now the updates will be written to this one. And what that allows us to do is make changes to the alternate target without disturbing the status of our pose target or our physics target. So it can be used for experimentation. It can be used for like temporarily animating a different armature with different features. So for example, uh, if you pay close attention to how the physics is applied to this, 
it's going to behave slightly differently if we remove the parent relationships. So like if we say, just clear all the parent relationships here, and then run this, there's now flex in between the bones and it gives us a slightly different behavior. This is mostly useful for things like ropes and wires where the rope or wire can get really far out of sync with the physics mesh in long chains of bones where there's like a subtle difference. And you can see some examples of that if you watch the ropes and wires tutorial on YouTube. Also underneath the setup panel, we have the physics setup button, this gigantic button here. And what this does is it runs the physics setup, as you might imagine. The uh, same thing happens when you select your pose target, physics setup runs, and then stuff starts to happen. Uh, but if for some reason it was not working with your existing settings and you want to refresh it, you can click this. So, for example, let's say you wanted to make a change to your character. Like, we wanted to add a head and neck to our creature here. And you notice we're doing the pose target and the physics mesh at the same time. Well, it doesn't work now. The physics won't run because in the physics visualization, it doesn't have the data for that, and it doesn't have the data on the back end to compute the head and neck. But if you simply click on physics setup, it will add that data. And now we have a head and neck on our physics visualization and the data stored in the back end. So now it will work with the head and neck. Another thing that you might use it for, let's say you wanted to make a whole bunch of this creature in different places for slightly different things, and you didn't want to have to update it and try to figure things out. You could just click on physics setup, and now we have multiple instances of our creature. Uh, another thing that could happen, you might get stuck. Maybe things are broken. They're just flat out not working for some reason. The add-on can get into weird states by doing weird sets of steps, and you want to just refresh the add-on. Well, you might do refresh, preferences add-on refresh, or go into your user preferences and run that. And in the event that you do that, uh, everything stops working. So then you can simply run physics setup again on whatever is not running and it will work again. Another situation where you might want to run the physics setup is if you save your file and close down Blender, then open it again and it doesn't automatically reload, then you could just select whichever armature is not running correctly and run the physics setup on it again. And it will refresh that. Underneath the physics setup button in the setup panel, we have connect bones and clear parents. And there are cases where the armature can get out of sync with the physics mesh, uh, especially in long chains of connected bones. This will allow the physics to deform the armature and sort of ignore what the parent influence would have on it. It's hard to see here, so let me give you an example where you would see it a little bit more clearly. I'm gonna go ahead and create a new armature and make a long chain of bones like this. And now make the pose target for it want to add an influence target to this. And maybe a rotation target also. And now when this runs, and I want to set it so that it does not reset. So we're going to set frame reset down. And now, if you look at the very end of this, notice how the armature is out of sync with the physics. So that would mean it'd be out of sync with collisions and other things. You can fix that really easily by selecting this and doing clear parents. And that will allow the armature to more closely follow the physics. And then if you do connect bones, it sets it back to its original state. And it gets that data from the pose target. So it'll just copy the parent relationships from the pose target. 
Underneath the clear parents, we have the shape reset checkbox, and that will be checked by default. What that does is it allows you to reset to some state other than the starting state. So if we reset now, then it goes back to where we first created it. If we wanted it to reset to some other place, like here, for example, then we need to select the physics visualization mesh in this case, because what we're actually doing here is taking advantage of Blender's existing shape key setup. So character physics works with shape keys. And if you wanted to reset to this shape, then the way to do that, you go to the shape keys underneath your edit tools here, and you do new shape from mix. And then this new shape exists, and the state of that shape is something other than its starting shape, which would be like the basis shape. So this key three here is now going to be active. And whatever shape key is active, and you know, this is how you change to a different active key, we will now reset to that location when we hit reset. So unfortunately, for now, you have to select the physics visualization mesh and work with shape keys. I will probably move that in the UI and put like a list of shapes here that you can select so that you don't have to mess around with that. So now when you hit reset, it goes back to that shape key. We've already looked at some of the influence targets, but there's one I haven't shown you yet. So for the sake of showing you how this works, I'm going to go ahead and create something like maybe a windmill or an electric motor by just extruding like so. And let's see, R, Y, 45, repeat that. That's fine. And then make this into a pose target. And then we're going to do setup. And now I have this strange physics object. And then underneath my influence targets, I am going to add a head target here and set the spring value to one and a tail target there and set the spring value of the tail target to one. And now I should be able to control this while it runs. So yes, I can move this around however I like. And now I'm going to add another target, the one that I haven't shown you yet. Let's add it to the tail of this bone here. So we're going to add another tail target, and this one's going to be directional. We're just going to give it some directional influence. And what that does, it will add a force, a continuous force on the y-axis. So you'll see this y-axis force. You can access that force on the individual bone, or you can access that force on the influence target itself. And so if you turn that up, then it gives it a stronger force in that direction. And something else interesting you can do is you can mix like parent relationships with these things. So Go ahead, go ahead and make this the child of that bone itself. And when I do that, then it's just going to start spinning. And it will keep spinning so long as that force is there. And of course, we could make it spin really fast if we wanted to. And then we can like rotate this around in space and it will keep spinning. And it actually has uh, an artificial kind of gyroscopic stability. So it will behave like a bicycle wheel if you tried to turn a bicycle wheel. Uh, gyroscopic forces are sort of an emergent property of doing math in this way, which I find very interesting. Uh, with this, you could build a car by setting up a mix of influence targets and constraints and parents and have your car drive around and you could put bones to make like squishy tires where it collides. So you could do some really interesting effects this way. Uh, you can also use these directional targets to put like a linear force on your creature. So say you created a simple walk cycle for this and you wanted it to keep moving in a direction. You wanted it to maybe accelerate in that direction. You could simply add a directional spring and 
point the y-axis the direction you want it to go and it will add some force to the walk cycle and sort of encourage it to go the direction you want it to. To explain the rest of the physics settings, I have a simple rig set up here that might approximate a person waving. And I have a little animation done here on my pose target that allows it to wave side to side. And you can see how the physics is behaving. Uh, if we turn the gravity down, then it becomes stronger and it will pull the character until it sort of hangs upside down. And, you know, depending on the strength of gravity, it might even stretch out the character. Gravity will always move along the global z-axis, regardless of how your character rig is rotated. So it's still going to fall down, even if we rotate it like this. Let me turn up the gravity here so you can see that. It's still falling downwards. Uh, you can change that, however, if you want to use a gravity object. If, say, you want to animate the direction of gravity changing, or have the gravity always be local to the character, like if you have a spider, and you want the spider to always fall sort of downward so it can walk upside down over a log or something like that, like I did in the spider tutorial video on YouTube. So let's add a gravity object. In this case, just a single arrow and we need to select it as the gravity object. Now gravity will point along this axis, whether you set it to positive or negative. So it's currently set to negative, so it's gonna fall in the direction opposite the direction this arrow is pointing. And of course you could animate that or make it a child of one of these bones so it spins with the character or whatever you like. Or you can just get rid of that and it will go back to global. Velocity, you might already be familiar with, like gravity. It has the effect of maintaining the existing motion. So it will make the character seem sort of less wobbly if you turn the velocity down. So it also has the effect of making your character appear more in control versus more sort of lazy. Or maybe they don't have the muscle strength that they need something like that. So it will affect the look of your character's sort of power and control if you set the velocity up or down. If you have lower velocity, it makes it seem like your character is more in control versus higher velocity, which makes it look like your character is sort of not paying attention or is sort of more ragdoll in the way that they move. Uh, we also have here linear solve iterations. And the effect that linear solve iterations has well, they exist in order to transmit motion throughout the rig. And they have the effect of allowing the different parts of the rig to stretch. And an armature doesn't actually have the ability to stretch. But if we clear parents, then we can see what's happening here. The physics is actually telling it that it is stretched out. And if we change the linear iters, has an effect similar to linear iterations in an IK solver, the way that it moves motion throughout the rig. So by turning that up, it will actually not allow it to stretch as much. If you turn this up really, really high, it will start to lag, but you should be able to, in most cases, use numbers around 40 or 50 uh, without noticing too much of a difference, and it sort of adds to the accuracy to use higher linear iterations. I'm going to set the gravity back to zero and reset this so that it can go back to upright. Angular iterations have a similar effect to linear iterations. In this case, you could think of it as increasing the muscular strength. So if it's trying to target this and it has to overcome forces like gravity and velocity and the mass and all that, then it's able to do that more accurately with higher angular iterations. So the higher this goes, the more exactly its motion will approximate the motion of the pose target. If you set this really low, like down to, say, 1, then it looks like your character's drunk. He's not very in control. He doesn't have much muscle strength. He'll even struggle to lift his arms if there's very much gravity. Uh, if you use iterations that are too low on the angular solver. 
So see how he's falling over with very little gravity. If we turn this up higher, then he can immediately stand up as he has the strength to maintain his upright position now. So I guess you could say angular iterations is something like muscular strength. Subframes is actually, it just changes the number of total physics solvers in between each animation frame. So this has the effect of changing the real world size of the animation. So let's say you're animating an ant or an insect or, or something and you want it to look like an insect would really look, well you probably would turn this up as it will have the effect of increasing the speed of the animation relative to the animation frames which in the end ends up looking like a smaller real world size. If that doesn't make sense to you then I would say just relative to other things in your scene that are animated set this until it looks right. And we've already looked at friction. So now if we go into pose mode we get some more settings that are specific to the bones. Um, we have mass, and mass does kind of what you might think. You'll notice that currently as this arm is waving, it's, it's actually moving the whole character quite a bit. If we turn down the mass of these bones that are waving to something much smaller, say, then it has a lot less of an effect. It's not transmitting as much energy because the relative mass is much smaller here than it is here. If we set the mass on one side really, really high, then it's going to have like more of an effect on the whole body and it's going to lean to that side and, you know, etc. And we can reset the mass and it will set the mass back to one for every bone. Angle Force has a similar effect to the angular solve iterations, except that you can control each bone with the angle force. So, for example, let's say you wanted to make these parts of the arm floppy on this side. You can turn the angle force down, and it sort of has the effect of very low muscle strength, or he's just not trying to hold his arm straight. So the strength with which each bone attempts to match the pose target can be controlled with the angle force. And this is really useful if you want to have a character with a floppy tail, or a character with a paralyzed arm, or characters with strange appendages that flop around, or whatever you might think to use it for. Anyway, you can control the specific muscle strength of each bone using this angle force value. And then I believe you can reset the angle force of all of the bones by hitting reset angular. Yes. So yeah, if we set them all to zero, then he just sort of falls all floppy. Underneath the record and playback tab, possibly the most important settings are animated and live. And when your animation timeline is running, then animated has to be checked or it won't move. So if we turn that off, it stops moving. And um, if we reset this, you can see that nothing happens until we check animated again. You can also run it live, and when it's running live, it doesn't require the animation timeline to be running. And I currently have this set so that under the physics, there are zero angular iters. If I change that back to 20, it's going to stand up and get all excited without calling anything inappropriate into your mind. And then I'm going to reset it. And then I will show you how to record. So, if we wanted to do a recording of maybe the character becoming all floppy, then we can, first of all, we're going to turn off the live and then turn animated back on so that it only runs when it's supposed to, or when my timeline is running. And then we're going to set this to record keyframes. And I want to create an animation of it falling over. So to get it to fall over, we're going to go back in here and set the angular iters down to zero. And then we have record to keyframes set. 
and then you'll have to set some things here. So skip frames, how many frames do you want it to skip between keyframes? We're going to say don't skip any frames. In other words, record keyframes every frame. And then the starting record frame is going to be 1, and the end record frame, let's do like 150. And this will end up being the name of our action. Floppy is okay. Maybe we'll just name it fall over. And then uh, we have the option of selected only location or rotation. And what that will do, if you only want to record the animation of the selected bones, bones that are selected in pose mode, then you can check this box. If you only want to record location or only want to record rotation, you can also do that. So let's give that a try. So currently we are recording every bone's movement, the location and the rotation, and we're recording every frame for 150 frames. So when we run this, we should get 150 frames of animation and then it will stop recording. As soon as it hits 150, Yep, and now we're no longer recording. So I can then select my fall over action, and here are all the keyframes that I just recorded. I want to turn animation off because I don't want the physics to be running while this action is attempting to move my armature, and now you see all of my animation that I just created. Something else that can be really useful underneath the record playback tab, down here under playback, is we have this advanced playback option. So there's animated and live, and then the advanced will allow you to create loops and target the pose target's action at different keyframes, and then those properties can be animated also. So for example, our pose target, I've already built in some animations here to allow him to look back and forth to see somebody get excited and then wave. And so I've called this action C's friend. And then let's say I wanted him to, let's say I wanted my physics guy over here to loop looking back and forth for a while. Then I can set a loop. So it starts at frame one, it ends at frame 79, because that's how long it takes for him to look back and forth. And it will just keep looping that back and forth as long as nothing changes with these properties here. So we can do, um, we need to turn animated on and he will start looking back and forth all sad. He's looking back and forth for his friend. When it gets to frame 79, it's going to loop back on it and keep doing that. It's just going to keep playing that over and over again as the animation plays. So it's sort of targeting that loop. And you see we have this action selected here. And it kind of doesn't matter what's happening over here because this is only looking at the frames between 1 and 79. So let's animate that property and let's say between frames 1 and 50 he sees his friend and then he gets excited. So at frame 50 we're going to keyframe the start frame and end frame and reset frame. And then at frame 51, we're going to switch to a different loop. So there we're going to find, let's see, where is this other animation? It looks like I have it starting at frame 127 and ending at 144. So go back to this guy here. And at frame 50 something, we're going to keyframe this to, actually, maybe we'll do it the very next frame, so it'll switch immediately to that loop. And we're going to keyframe the start frame at 127, and then the end frame at 144, and then the reset frame also at 144. And now I can switch between these actions. So he's looking side to side now, and as soon as he gets to frame 50, he switches and he sees his friend and he's like, hey. But now it's looping that. So it's looping between when he gets excited and sees his friend. 
Uh, so we want to turn that loop off probably after it plays one time. So it'll play one time, gets to like right there and stops at frame 67. So we'll keyframe it again. So the start frame, the end frame, and the reset frame. And then we'll go one frame. And now we'll switch to the waving. So we'll come back to frame 68 and we'll set these. We've got to figure out where the waving animation happened. And it looks like the waving happens over here on frame 190 to 200. Okay, so we'll go back to this guy again and frame 68. We're going to set this to 190 for the start frame and keyframe it. In frame is 200 and keyframe it. And then the reset frame is 200 and keyframe it. And then now when we play the whole thing back, our friend is sad. He's looking around. He sees his friend and he gets excited. His shoulders lift and then he starts waving. Hey friend, how's it going? Nice to see you. And he'll just keep waving until we animate this to do something else. And, you know, of course I could adjust this to make it look more realistic and all that, but I'm really only illustrating how you can animate these to play different loops and mix different actions. So moving down the list, we have the settings panel. And this is mostly a placeholder for some features I plan to implement later. For now, it contains a skip auto load boolean value and a reload function. Blender was crashing sometimes when I was trying to save and load because of a bug that turned out to be in Blender's code. I think I found a workaround, so hopefully the save and load will be working correctly. But if for some reason you're saving a file and when you try to reload it, Blender crashes, then you might try setting this to skip auto load. And then once you set that, then go ahead and save it again. And you see the physics is running right now. And if I say I saved and reloaded this file, so we're just gonna simulate that. Now, nothing happens when I run the animation, but I can manually reload. And when I manually reload, then it basically does what it would have normally done if I'd saved it uh, without skipping the auto load. So, you know, currently it's running. It's not going to skip auto load. I'm going to save it and then I'm going to revert and it should keep running. And another thing that you can do, if for some reason you get stuck and you have to reload the add-on, which uh, if you go into your, your search and you do add-ons refresh, then it will reload the add-on. If you just hit reload, so I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, you might not be able to see this in the video, but I'm reloading the add-on. Um, now it's not gonna run, so the, the animation timeline is run, running, but the physics is not running. I can go ahead and hit reload and it will reset up the physics and it will run from basically the last state where you saved it. If you have the version of character physics that was released at the same time as this video, then you'll have this control rig tools panel and you'll need an armature to be active. And I've got this character that I downloaded from Mixamo and it came with a rig already. And to control it, I created a physics rig and then I created a bunch of constraints to make it so my physics rig could control the existing rig. That way I didn't have to mess around with trying to redo weight painting or anything like that. And since the current version of character physics has some limitations, like it can only do connected bones, and the Mixmo rig has bones that are parent-child bones, but with offset, uh, then I just created a rig to match my physics rig and then use the constraints. And as I was doing that, it occurred to me that there would be some ways to do that process a lot more quickly. So I created tools for kind of automating some of those steps and in the process, um, underneath this control rig tools panel here, came up with a few things. So we can turn the constraints off and on. And if we turn them off, we need to select our 
original rig here. We turn that off, then it no longer has that effect. And I can turn them back on. I can also turn the influence up or down. And it just goes into the constraints that are existing and turns them up and down. And I can also remove all of the existing constraints and it will delete all of my constraints off of there, which I don't want to do. So let me show you how I set that up. We're going to pretend like this is our original rig. And um, currently, if I turn the influence up, then it you know still has the same constraints because it's a copy of the one that had the constraints. So I'm going to go ahead and, you know, these are all green because they have constraints. I'm going to delete all of the constraints that are there. So this would be what it would be like in a starting state. Now, this only works if you create the constraints here, because what it does is it will name the constraints that are created with a convention that's like, you know, CP underscore whatever, and then it looks for constraints with that name. That way it won't remove any existing constraints that you might have if they were not created with this system. So the process of creating like a control rig using this system would be fairly straightforward. So you have your existing animation rig, and, you know, we assume it's in a clean state, as in there's no existing constraints on it. And this needs to be empty. Um, you can select a, a rig that's existing, or you can create a control rig. So we're going to go ahead and create a control rig. And when we do that, I don't know if you caught that, but this bone was created. So create control rig, and it automatically assigns it to this spot here. And this is what it's going to look for. And it also sets the transforms to match. So the rotation, location, and scale are going to match whatever rig you did that to. And that makes it so that the constraints work correctly. Because if there's a discrepancy between the global rotation, location, and stuff, then Blender's constraints are kind of hard to figure out. So once we have our rig created, we can go into edit mode for our control rig and actually just grabbed this you know the bones as I was creating them and I want like the base of the spine here to follow my control rig so I'm going to put this in here to match the base of the spine and you can see that the bone roll is just sort of arbitrary and as you're creating this the bone roll is going to get all wonky or random and you probably don't want that. Uh, what happens is the transform constraints and child of constraints and things don't work predictably if the bone roll doesn't match. And since these are disconnected bones and character physics in this particular release only supports connected bones, then you know you go ahead and kind of add bones to approximate the transforms that you want. Something like that. So now that we've got a few bones here in the control rig uh, with our original rig here selected, if we select one of these bones in the original rig and we do like a copy transforms constraint, for example, it's going to add a constraint and then it's going to set the bone roll of whichever bone is closest by. So in this case, it doesn't match exactly but the nearest bone, it's going to guess that the head and tail of the bone that you want is this one that's closer here. So it's going to set up a constraint when we do add copy transforms. And then it's going to pick this bone right here, and then it's going to set the bone roll to match it. And we can kind of go down the line and do that with, you know, whatever bones we want to make copy these transforms. So we do that, it sets it. We do that, and now that we have uh, those things in place, our original rig can now be influenced by the control rig that we're making. And if you're going to do more complicated things like child of constraints or IK constraints, then you might need to play around and set up pull targets. So 
It doesn't do everything for you, but it actually does quite a bit, and I found that I was mostly using copy transform constraints. And if you ignore all of this other crazy stuff that I have going on, and look at the bone constraint settings, which is right here, then it's automatically picked the correct rig and it's picked the correct bone. And then if I go and change like the influence, for example, so it's changing the influence on the constraint, even though I'm doing it in the control rig tools panel. And if I turn it on and off, then it's going to turn off all of these. So it adds this CP underscore CP underscore uh, to the name of the constraint. So that's how that works. All right, the last panel that I want to look at is the motion capture tools. And it very simply just allows you to directly influence your physics rig with the state of the motion capture rig. So once again, I have a pose target here that is identical to my physics rig over here. And this pose target happens to have motion capture data recorded onto it. And this is just a Mixamo character rig and a Mixamo character. You'll notice though that I have modified it a little bit in that I've added connected bones. So the Mixamo rig has offset bones and uh, as of the time that I'm making this, I don't support that yet. I probably will very soon. So I've gone ahead and connected the bones and then I'm just playing the motion capture file on it. Now if I set this up as my pose target, so we select this to be our physics armature, and then we select this as our pose target. Then, you know, we start out with the default settings. What's going to happen then is basically it's just going to fall and crumple into a big pile. And that's because this rig isn't really built to be optimized for physics, and a lot of motion capture rigs aren't. So if I were to build this up from scratch to run with the physics rig, I would do it very different. But I can make some adjustments. So for example, if I turn the angular stiffness up, and let's turn the linear up a little bit, it's going to be a little bit less just falling on the ground. And we can turn off the gravity, or turn the gravity, ah, we'll just go ahead and turn it off. And now you'll get She's kind of trying to match those movements, but it's hard to get animation like you want from motion capture data. We go down here to the motion capture tools panel. And we're going to target this as a motion capture rig. And you could make a duplicate of this or a separate rig or something like that. Uh, it still has to be matching. But now that we have this targeted, if we give it some influence, then we try to run it. Now it's going to sort of override the physics and instead be influenced by what the actual motion capture is doing. But the physics is still running. So if I do something like I have this plane here set as a collider object, she's still going to collide with this plane even though the motion capture is running. And then I can also turn up the gravity, and the animation is going to look very different if I suddenly add a whole bunch of gravity effect. So we turn this down to something, and now she's looking kind of heavy, maybe struggling to play the animation because she's falling over. And then the influence of the motion capture is kind of picking her up again. So, I mean, you'd have to be careful here, like negative 0.2 or something would be a little bit more like you might want in order to make it seem like she's just a little bit heavier than she was when it was recorded or a little bit more tired or something. I'm going to try negative 0.4, see what happens. So you can see her swings a little lower and her head's down a little bit. And then, you know, she might run into the ground here a little bit. And because the ground is higher, she's bending over a little bit more. So basically, the uh, motion capture influence allows you to take advantage of existing motion capture stuff 
and still use the physics to get some other effects that you might want. And the settings are pretty simple. It's just you target your rig and then you set how much you want it to influence it. And that's pretty much it for all of the current features in the character physics system. If you have any questions, you can join the Discord and ask questions there. You can also send me an email. And if you want to use this, I recommend you do the monthly subscription because I'm putting out a lot of updates and the one-time price is probably higher and it doesn't always allow me to capture someone's email if you buy off of Blender Market. So unless I have your email, I can't provide you with updates. So thanks for watching everybody and please provide feedback.